health inequalities, health equity, intersectionality, concepts that have been flying around increasingly recently. But how central and embedded are such considerations in health research? And if they're not, should they be? And how do we bring about such a culture change? This is the second part of our discussion on this topic with Dr. Stan Papoulias, Savi Hensman, and Dr. Anna Porocha Escudero. At the end of the first part of the episode, we talked about how concepts like intersectionality move across domains and what that means for their original intent. Here is what was discussed next. Absolutely. I think that links, Anna, with what you were saying before with your effort to do that mainstreaming, that full embedding of equity in what we do. Is mainstreaming then the same as normalization? I think it's an element, right? Because to make something mainstream, I, I, there are many problems with the word mainstream and the way it has been used and abused, but yes, let's take it in a positive way. But for me, normalization is when, as opposed to alienating or finger pointing or querying or treating something, otherizing is the word I'm looking for. So for me, normalizing is the process of like trying to stop the other, you know, being a bad thing. And it's that process of making things visible and opening avenues for discussion and perhaps shifting mindsets. So yes, I think it's for me, it's a crucial part of the process of mainstreaming. I mean, I, I would see, and perhaps I'm being optimistic here, but there has been a lot of effort put into improving things. And I think many people genuinely do want to see greater diversity, a wider range of people having a chance to have a say in health and social care research. And of course, people keep organising and pushing to change things regardless of what happens in universities anyway. So some of that is about aligning efforts in communities for instance, around tackling the effects of pollution, especially on people living in inner city areas who may be demographically largely people already from communities experiencing multiple disadvantage or discrimination, and bringing together the efforts of campaigners who have often been personally affected and people in their neighbourhoods and researchers, scientists, uh, has been very effective, I think, in raising awareness. So there are a range of ways in which action is happening. And I think many people are doing important and valuable research. Some of the challenges bringing that together, learning from what different people have achieved or are achieving, as well as some of the obstacles that they face in trying to undertake research from that perspective and then put the findings into practice. And I think what you're saying, Sav, there is really important because one of the things we often hear is that health inequality is too big an issue for us to solve. It's for the government. It's for somebody high up there. Whilst we're all part of the system, there's something for everyone to do. And I guess the second part to that and a question to you is to what extent are those issues, whether we're talking about health equity or mainstreaming that language, that way of thinking, an academic issue or does it go beyond research and academia? I'd say that, for instance, in terms of World Health Organization Europe and more widely, and the United Nations related efforts on health and social care and so forth, very often within the mainstream of discussion around public health, issues of inequity do come up. And they're something that are very much noticed by perhaps the more aware health and social care professionals and workers in the community may be quite evident to those of us who are patients or people with long term conditions and or carers. So these are very much issues outside the academy as well. But one of the things that I think that is perhaps strange to me coming into the university setting a few years ago is that sometimes research on these matters that ties in with experience on the ground and involvement by people with lived experience is detached depending on what subject or label the research has. So if research is being done by geographers or social scientists rather than health researchers, for instance, it may never be brought together, even if it's probing overlapping issues that might affect people's health in very direct ways that affect the determinants of, of health. So in some ways, it can feel quite fragmented. And maybe that's one of the challenges for people working in academic settings to 
be aware that something might be going on outside your own discipline that may actually be relevant to that. And that's something that people in community settings can't necessarily easily do because there's only so much time that anybody has if they're trying to get by, get through their everyday life in terms of reading learned papers, trying to make sense of them, let alone even being able to access them. So Savi, you talk about fragmentation or, you know, silos and not bringing together research that would benefit from being kind of more joined up. And and I'd agree with you, but I would also say that this is a, a sort of fundamental part of the kind of organization of research ecologies in this country and elsewhere. So how funding for research is done, how disciplines are sort of held apart in a particular way, how contracts are done, how research labor is done and by whom. And so I think that we need to also look at the broader systems where research takes place. So for example, we've got funders such as MRC, the Medical Research Council, or the NIHR, the National Institute for Health and Care Research. And the way that the expectations on their sort of calls are for a very, very particular kind of isolation of, there is anticipation of a certain kind of methodology, of a certain kind of disciplinary specialization, and of a certain kind of timeline to deliver the outputs. Once you have those kinds of very set timelines, those set expectations for, you know, deliverables, and those set expectations for what kind of methodologies are appropriate or rigorous and what, which ones are not, then there's very limited space to move outside that. And the funding system and the way in which targets are measured and success is measured within that funding system, which is to say how quickly you recruit to target uh, for the most part, prevent that kind of different thinking that you're talking about. So for instance, I see often calls for projects or programs or infrastructure funding from one of the big funders. And they always say, we encourage, we demand patient public involvement and we demand or encourage interdisciplinarity. But when you dig down to it, you find out that actually interdisciplinarity does not mean bringing in the social science and the humanities. Indeed, in this country, the social science and the humanities are increasingly defunded and purposefully so. So it's interdisciplinarity, for example, with data science and neuroscience and psychology, but not outside that domain. And when it comes to patient public involvement, it's like on the one hand, there's an expectation to do good involvement, to do diverse involvement, to do good community engagement, to go to the so-called seldom heard communities. But on the other hand, the infrastructure and the funding and the spaces, the time and the resources for that kind of involvement are missing. So you've got an expectation, but you don't have the instruments that would allow you to fulfill that expectation or to put it differently, the way in which deliverables have to be delivered pushes against changing the culture of what you and Anne identified in different ways as, you know, a need to change the culture of research. So I'm very, very interested also how Anna has experienced that, because there is a, how do you change a culture without changing the structures? I cannot answer that. I can clarify quickly. I, as an anthropologist, I rarely use the word culture. I think it's so misused. So what I mean by culture is cultures of research, but uh, cultures of research is interlinked with the structures. So you cannot, yeah, you cannot change the culture of research if you don't change those structures. So like the, the ways of thinking, you need to change the ways of thinking and, and doing. We wrote a paper on that and we could have a deep conversation without being censored. But yes, so I use, and maybe I didn't use the word culture very well, is changing the structure or systems. But so that, why I use culture? Because people sometimes think about changing systems as doing paperwork, you know, more policies, more crap, more crap, more crap, box ticking. Whereas it has to be something deep, you know, theoretical level. So that's why I think I chose the word culture, meaning that it has to be ways of doing and thinking. Am I making sense? I absolutely agree with you. And I guess that's what I was trying to say as well. And kind of the move from one discipline to the other. What really struck me is that there is no space to think to reflect or to think with others or to think with new others, with new partners, with community members and so on. You have to deliver. So you have to even deliver before you've even started. You know, so you have to plot your delivery precisely before you even started. So any sense of thinking of experimentation and of space of failure, because if you experiment or if you start working differently, there is failure coming as well, right? So, But there is very little space for that because you always already should have delivered. And so the spaces for something different or for a change of culture in the way you've just said it, Anna, I think are becoming more and more restricted in many ways. 
outside universities is another story, of course. I'm don't, I don't want to yeah. generalise. I'm talking about within those kinds of institutions. Nevertheless, there are research teams, people who are long-standing patient and public contributors who have been working together in ways that have been very fruitful in terms of delving into the experiences of people who experience multiple forms of disadvantage and discrimination, which may be linked with societal imbalances in power and status. And I think much can be learned from what they've achieved and are achieving, uh, as well as confronting some of the obstacles that get in the way. So I, I think that the outlook isn't simply gloomy, but people do keep coming up against that pressure to have, for instance, reasonably quick findings that are positive about a particular intervention, for instance, or which offer a clear-cut solution rather than sometimes saying, we don't know, or this doesn't seem to work, or this particular intervention may only work in very limited circumstances. So I think there can be that pressure to get published in prestigious journals with results that look striking and positive rather than having that space to delve more deeply. Nevertheless, people are doing important things and I think there are ways of learning from that. Sometimes these might be people who might be quite early in their careers researchers or they might be what I might call mixed career researchers, people who have other valuable experiences rooted perhaps in their own health and care or that of those around them or who have worked in other settings which mean coming up against some of those systems of inequality and injustice. And they bring that to the table. Uh, some of them draw on their own lived experience as researchers. So this work is going on. And one of the things that can be done perhaps is to help to share some of those findings from that and how this has happened and some of the links with communities which have developed and the ways in which people have very often come in into the research world from community settings, from service user and carer settings, and made a difference to that while recognising the limitations that exist. And being able to talk about the complexity of the issues, but the fascination of a field in which there's always something more to discover. So does that mean that the way to bring about the change we need is through genuine collaboration, open communication, and then mainstreaming strategy, Anna? I do think so. And for me, the, the collaboration, because collaboration for me means bringing the different legs of the table together to that table, you know? The more the solutions are thought, having as many worldviews as possible in a more democratic, horizontal way, the more likely is that the solutions are effective. I would say that that's part of it, but it's also recognising some of the, the barriers and pressures, for instance, around funding of research, more generally um, socioeconomic conditions that can unravel some of the gains that have been made. So professionals are very often working in extremely pressured settings and asking them to, to do new things or do things in a new way it could be that much harder when there's that constant instability, very often people coming and going, those who are health providers themselves becoming ill under the strain, cramped conditions in hospitals and clinics and long waiting lists and times, a cost of living crisis, what might be described as a hostile environment for an increasing number of minority groups in society. So, that all of these things can interact to get in the way of doing the best kind of research and then putting the findings into practice. And I think that recognising some of those barriers and challenges uh, outside the academic culture and structures, however those might be defined, is important as well. And the pressure to come up with maybe quick solutions that don't actually work. Some way of reducing pressures mean that people are being asked to take more responsibility for their own health and care. Of course, all of us should do what we can and there may be things that we can learn from one another with the benefits of research. But I think that there can be those pressures that pull research in unhelpful directions and put pressure on researchers to come up with positive results that don't actually work in real life settings. I just wanted to add to that. I mean, absolutely, good research and good collaborative work does take place despite all of this and will probably continue to take place. But 
I also think that within the current research ecology, and I'm only speaking about the UK, this tends to be, as far as I can see, much more of an individual or small group or localized phenomenon. Because I'm just thinking about, you know, if you go back to the NIHR, for example, the NIHR was created at the moment in 2006, where there was a very strong pro-research agenda pumping funding to health research, which was a sort of part of the new labor program to revitalize the NHS in a very particular way. There is now a legacy of 14 years of austerity. And we are in a very different moment where, for example, research costs universities money, right? So universities are at the moment in, in a moment of crisis because of the system that has been set up, uh, needing more and more recruitment of students. They don't make money out of research. So it is not in the interest of universities to fund more and more research. In fact, every time they host researchers who are funded externally, they kind of lose money. You have to think about the kind of system where research funds are scarce, university interests are elsewhere in terms of how to you know, survive and make money out of international students. Then you've got like the hostile environment, you've got the depletion of funds from the NHS. So these are the kind of broader and an increase in social and health inequalities more broadly. Now, there are people doing good work within that, absolutely. But how do you then see a possibility for that work to gain critical mass? within a system that is depleted and within an environment of different kinds of environments for health care, for living, which are increasingly hostile, are made hostile. They're not sort of hostile because of the economy. They are made hostile because of very specific choices, political choices and policies. I think there hasn't been an episode in this podcast series where funders haven't been mentioned part of the issue, part of the solution. So they're definitely highly due for an episode. Funders, please reach out to us. We'll invite you to our next episode. Speaking of change, raising those issues, I want to ask each and every one of you, what is then your vision for the future? Like, what is it you would like to see that would indicate at least progress in the right direction of equity-sensitive research, of mainstreaming health equity? I go back to the question when you asked whether intersectionality is a... I don't know how you say You put it very well. I am not diplomatic. But whether you ask whether intersectionality is a play word for academics and the universities. And for me, it's not. And I'm going to read a quotation that I think encapsulates how I envisage intersectionality. This is by Bell Hooks, a black feminist from the US. And she says, I came to theory because I was hurting. The pain within me was so intense that I could not go on living. I came to theory desperate, wanted to comprehend to grasp what was happening around and within me. I saw in theory, then a location for Helen. And that for me, that's why intersectionality is so important for the public in general, not only for the universities, because it talks about hurting, what is happening in our societies. And that links me to a concept that I use a lot in my work, and the concept is on critical health literacy. I envisage a connection between research and the needs of the wider population. That is no one way direction where the population feeds information to researchers, but also researchers try to work with the population and different communities to develop critical consciousness and reflection of the social factors that make people hurt. You know, what are the social factors that affect people's living and working conditions? That knowledge becomes a billion for personal, but also social change, because then when people know deeper, they can organize better and they can do alliances with different actors system that actually have the power to make change happen. So for me, the answer is yes, definitely intersectionality should be used as a bridge to connect the academy, the universities with the population. There's a different quote from a different space. This is Yasna Russo, who is a survivor researcher working in Germany currently, while well, I'm paraphrasing, but she says that we talk about people making movements, creating activism, creating movements. But what we talk much less about is how movements make people. So when we talk about lived experience, sometimes we essentialize it. It's a something that I have and I kind of, it's my intrinsic truth and so on. I think of lived experience not like that, but as something coming from the future. What I mean by that is that the kind of lived experience I think that Anna is gesturing at when you talked about critical health literacy, right? And I see this as coming from 
collective action. So moments of collective action, which enable you to reinterpret that experience in light of structural inequalities, and therefore act to change this and act to create broader solidarities. So for me, lived experience is what comes from the future. As for a vision for the future, well, it's a vision where there is a radical redistribution of funds and resources away from universities and towards community organizations. Because if we're talking about fundamental transformation, we have to make a fundamental change in terms of who holds the money, how it's distributed, what the aims of research are, and who benefits. And so unless these kinds of parameters change, then we cannot really talk about transformation. We cannot talk about social justice. I think my vision for the future would include increasingly close working between research teams and patient service user carer and community organisations and networks, particularly those where people might bring lived experience of particular health and social care issues or challenges and obstacles to health to bear. And at the same time, bringing in perspectives and working alongside those in health and care commissioning and provision who would like to draw on that research, which is community informed, maybe community led, alongside willingness to probe some of the more difficult and complex issues, recognising the imbalances of power that exist in communities, in voluntary organisations, among people who might be users of a particular service, among people who might have certain things in common, but also don't have identical experiences, a recognition of some of the ways in which situations may change over time and people status may rise or fall or fluctuate across various kinds of axes of disadvantage and discrimination and injustice. So I think that willingness to work and ability to work together, which does require major changes of which there might be signs and examples of good practice from which we can learn, could be very important in moving things forward. A willingness to do longer term work and have funding for that, as well as research which comes up with clear interventions and has more immediate results, and a willingness to find out that some things don't work rather than coming from that assumption that they do. A willingness to grapple with some of the difficulties, for instance, of researching multiple conditions for people with multiple forms of disadvantage and discrimination without conflating everybody's experience within any one category. So it's not simple and it's all right to recognise that it's not simple. But advances can be made, especially if those with different positions in the health and social care system, including those of us might be people with long-term conditions or carers or both, in as many of us are, are also regarded as important in that network of what happens, especially when we're working alongside one another and our neighbours and community to bring about change that benefits those people who experience greatest disadvantage and greatest health inequalities. So it's not simple, but change can happen. Anna, Savi, Stan, thank you all so much for helping us understand where we're at with our equity journey, challenge us and how we're doing things and help us envision a better future. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. There can be no culture change without structural change. We need more space for reflection, for innovation, for movements that create people, for collective action, for lived experience and for celebration of good practice. How has your equity journey evolved and what is your vision for the future? Share your thoughts with hashtag implementequity.